In this lesson, we will finally get to do some chemistry. We'll look at how elements gain or lose electrons to form ions. Then we'll look at how these ions combine to form ionic compounds. Recall that adding or removing electrons from an atom creates a charged particle called an ion. The properties of an ion depend on its charge, especially positive versus negative. When ions have a positive charge, we call them cations. When ions have a negative charge, we call them anions. Here is a super dumb mnemonic to remember cation versus anion. Remember that cations have a positive charge and onions make me cry because they are so negative. Only the dumbest mnemonics here. We've got plenty more like this. Atoms become ions by gaining or losing electrons. Here's how the process looks on the atomic scale. Chlorine is a big bully and demands an electron from sodium. Sodium is such a weakling that it just hands over its electron. Now, sodium is missing an electron, so it has a positive charge, and chlorine has an extra electron, so it has a negative charge. It's easy and common for students to forget that electrons have a negative charge. So losing an electron makes an ion more positive. Now, since most of chemistry involves adding and subtracting electrons, I personally think it would be easier if electrons had a positive charge. And if you agree with me, uh, you might want to go back in time and have a frank little chat with Benjamin Franklin. However, in our current universe, the electrons have a negative charge, so try to keep that in mind and be sure to forgive yourself if you make any mistakes. Continuing on. The movement of electrons is a fundamental part of chemical reactions. Here's a helpful way to think of it. There are certain magic numbers of electrons that I will call the noble numbers. Elements have extra stability if they have a noble number of electrons. The reason will be revealed to you in chapters six and seven, but for now, just imagine that each of the elements wants to lose, steal, or share electrons until they have one of these seven noble numbers. Now, there's no need to memorize the noble numbers of electrons because they are written on the periodic table. Specifically, the column of the table that contains noble gases, each of these elements already has a noble number of electrons, which is what makes them so unreactive. The noble gases are quite happy the way that they are. They don't want to gain or lose or share electrons. Therefore, they don't react with anything. This can make the other elements quite jealous, and it often causes them to react violently. Returning to real chemistry, here's the reaction between sodium metal and chlorine gas. Sodium loses an electron, becoming a cation. Chlorine gains an electron, becoming an anion. Notice that both ions now contain a noble number of electrons, which is why the compound formed, table salt, is quite unreactive. As I mentioned, elements will steal or share electrons to become noble. This lesson focuses on ionic compounds, which are formed by one element stealing electrons from another. Ionic compounds are also called salts. Section 2.6, as well as chapters 8 and 9, will focus on compounds who share electrons. These compounds form molecules. Ionic compounds are always formed between a cation and an anion. Cations are usually metal, since metals tend to lose electrons. Anions are usually nonmetals, since nonmetals are greedy and try to steal electrons from other elements. You will need to be able to predict how many electrons an element will gain or lose in order to become noble. One way to do this is to imagine wrapping your periodic table into a cylinder so that element number two is next to element number three, element number 10 is next to element number 11, and so on. I've done this and shown it to the left. The noble gases here are in the center of my cylindrical periodic table. The metals are shown in blue. The shortest path 
for the metals to become noble is by losing electrons indicated by shifting to the left on the periodic table. The nonmetals are shown in yellow. The shortest path for the nonmetals to become noble is by gaining electrons, aka moving to the right on the table. Furthermore, the number of spaces on the table that an electron needs to move to become noble is the number of electrons that element needs to gain or lose. This is why elements of the same group form ions of the same charge, because they are all the same number of spaces away from the noble gases. Very commonly in this class, you will need to determine what charge a specific ion will have. I like to pretend I'm playing a board game with the elements. The goal is to get the column of... <clears throat> I like to pretend I'm playing a board game with the elements. The goal is to get your element to the column that is the noble gas column in the fewest number of moves. Moving to the right causes you to gain an electron. Moving to the left causes you to lose an electron. Let's pretend we're aluminum. Aluminum could become noble by gaining five electrons. However, it takes fewer moves <sighs> Aluminum could become noble by gaining five electrons, moving five spaces to the right. However, it takes fewer moves for aluminum if it instead loses three electrons, moving three spaces to the left. Therefore, the aluminum ion tends to lose three negatively charged electrons and has a three plus charge at the end. Time for some practice problems. Pause the video and see if you can answer these questions. All right, here are the answers. Fluorine is in group 7A and only needs to gain one electron to become noble. It will have a one minus charge. Group 2A needs to lose two electrons to become noble. Elements from this group will then have a two plus charge. The last question, hopefully you caught this, it's a bit of a trick. Noble gases, which live in group 8A, already have a noble number of electrons. Thus, they do not form any ions and do not gain a charge. After elements become ions, the cations and anions attract each other and they form an ionic compound called a salt. In this class, you will be expected to write the formula for ionic compounds. The most important rule when doing this is to make sure the formula is charge neutral. This means that it has an equal number of positive and negative charges. The formula for sodium chloride is straightforward. Since both ions have a charge of one, you only need to write one of each ion to get a neutral formula. However, in sodium sulfide, you need two sodium atoms for every sulfide atom, since sulfide has a two minus charge. A sample of sodium sulfide will contain twice as many sodium atoms as sulfur atoms. Sometimes you have to get a little creative in these formulas. Aluminum sulfide needs two aluminum ions for every three sulfide ions in order to be charge neutral. Before you move on to the next slide, convince yourself that the math for each of these formulas works out. Ionic compounds must be charge neutral. If it were possible to form an ionic compound that were not charge neutral, it would literally explode. Time for another practice problem. Pause the video and write the formula of the compound formed between magnesium and nitrogen. And here is your solution. To determine the formula for magnesium nitride, we first need to determine what the charges of the ions are. Magnesium is in group 2A, therefore it loses two electrons to form an ion with a two plus charge. Nitrogen is in group 5A, therefore it gains three electrons to form an ion with a three minus charge. Lastly, the formula must remain charge neutral. If we use three magnesium ions and two nitride ions, then the charges cancel out.
Therefore, magnesium nitride is Mg3N2. Be sure to check your math on these. They can get a little tough.